Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. Greetings from a slightly less snowy and slightly warmer Chicago. I am Chris Wheat, Director of the Spiegler Center at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Today, we are happy to host Sarah Miller, David Moss, and James Robinson for a conversation on whether and how market power could lead to political power. And the conversation will be moderated by uh, the Center Faculty Director, Luigi Zingales. This is the concluding session of our Antitrust and Competition Conference, Monopolies and Politics series. Throughout this series, we have gathered scholars and experts alike to analyze the relationship between market concentration and undesirable political outcomes. To check out the previous sessions from this series, please be sure to visit our YouTube channel. Before we begin, please note that we are on the record and we will post a video on our YouTube channel later. If you have any questions for the speakers, uh, we will address them in the last 15 minutes or so. And you can submit those questions via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens. And as usual, the views expressed by the guests are their own views and not those of the Speaker Center or the University of Chicago. We hope that you'll be joining us for more upcoming webinars. Please also check our website, as well as our publication, promarket.org, and our Capitalism podcast. The links to the platforms can be seen in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And now please allow me to very briefly introduce our speakers. David Moss is the Paul Witten Sherrington Professor at the Harvard Business School. James Robinson is the Reverend Dr. Richard L. Pearson Professor of Global Conflict Studies at the University of Chicago. James also is the Institute Director for the Pearson Institute for the Study of Resolution of Global Conflicts. And Sarah Miller is the Executive Director of the American Economic Liberties uh, Project. Without further ado, I turn it over to Luigi. Uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, as many of you know, uh, in May 2020, we were planning to have a conference on the threat that monopolies pose to democracy. Unfortunately, the pandemic forced us to move that conference online and spread it out over time. As a result, we divided this conference into two phases. The first phase, which took place in the spring and fall of 2020, brought together economists, uh, legal scholars, historians, and political scientists to explore the historical evidence on the interconnection between market power and political power. Our webinars, which are all available on the Stigler YouTube channel, discuss the role of industrial cartel in facilitating the rise of Nazi Germany and of nationalistic Japan, the impact of Chebol and other industrial conglomerates in the political dynamics of South Korea, Israel, Brazil, and Mexico, and also the rise and fall of anti-monopoly movements in the United States. All this discussion led to the conclusion that market and political power are indeed intrinsically linked, and that a vibrant democracy can exist only when there is a vibrant economic competition and vice versa. This conclusion is worrisome because we, were, we are witnessing growing market concentration in the United States and abroad, a theme that we explore at the Stigler Center in our 2017, 18, and 19 conference. Should we worry for our democracy? If so, what can be done? Uh, this is the reason why the second part of our conference was dedicated to understanding whether antitrust policies should consider the political power of corporations as a factor. The webinar that we hosted in the past few months discussed why traditional antitrust policy has been unable to prevent the rise of large political powerful firms, the benefits and peril of an antitrust being redesigned to promote polit uh, political and economic liberty and whether there is such a thing as too much competition. We then move to explore whether new methods are available to tackle the problem of concentration of political power. In particular, we hosted workshops focused on identifying a connection between market power and knowledge politics, as well as how to develop a system that can help identify economic conglomerates with disproportional political power. We really work at the frontier of the existing knowledge and much more work is needed in this area. In this final session, we have assembled a dream team to go broader and discuss what are the foundation of a political and economic system that is resilient, that is resilient to pressure by powerful product interest. 
they have gathered leading experts who come from different backgrounds and bring different experiences. We will start with two short uh, five minutes intervention by each one of them. And the first one, in the first one, I would like each panelist to provide his or her assessment about the magnitude of the problem in the United States and the world at large. And then I will ask them, what are the key institutional economic features of a resilient system? So why don't we start uh, with David, who is gonna bring us some interesting historical evidence. Okay, well, thank you, Luigi. It's a pleasure to be here um, this afternoon and I wish we were in person, but still nice to, nice to see you and see you all. Um, so as I understand it, the question for, uh, for our panel is whether market power leads to political power. And I thought in a sense, it's kind of, um, it's funny, it's a funny question to ask an American historian and that's what I am an American historian because across much of this nation's you know, history, especially over the 19th and early 20th centuries, I think there probably would have been a, a good deal of surprise that the question needed to be asked um, at all. Because the answer in a sense, at least to many would have seemed self-evident. That is whether market power can lead to political power. I think the answer uh, in, in many cases would have been an obvious yes. And, and you can see this kind of assumption um, in, for example, in early debates over antitrust policy. So the historian Richard Hofstetter famously wrote that the early advocates of antitrust, quote, you know, wanted to keep concentrated private power from destroying democratic government. So he saw that as kind of a central uh, animating theme of the, of, the, of the work, the early work on antitrust policy. He also wrote a little less famously, but also I think importantly that quote, antitrust must be understood as the political judgment of a nation whose leaders had always shown a keen awareness of the economic, the economic foundations of politics. So as Hofstetter was suggesting, concerns about economic concentration and political power and the links between the, the two were commonplace and went far actually beyond debates over antitrust law. Um, if you look, for example, I'll just give a couple examples, but 15 years after the Sherman Act, the Sherman Act was in 1890, which by the way, was the same year that the uh, Chicago University of Chicago was founded, I, I believe. 15 years later after that, in 1905, lawmakers in New York, just one example, but probed concentration in the life insurance industry as part of what was called the Armstrong investigation, again, in 1905. And if you look at those that investigation and those hearings, it's just absolutely clear that, the, that the, in a sense, the, the central concern, or at least a central concern um, about the big three, life insure, big three life insurers, which really dominated the industry, it was the concern was not just their economic power, but again, their political influence. And, that, and, and in fact, I would say, you know, it was a, that, that concern about that was at least as large, if not larger than concerns about adverse economic impact. And so just to give one brief illustration of this, at one point in the hearings, the lead counsel, there's sort of a who's who involved here, but Charles Evans Hughes was the lead counsel. And he was trying in a sense in these hearings to personify the undue political influence of the life insurance industry, which was a huge industry. And so he was, he was interviewing the witness E.H. Harriman, who was of course a big railroad uh, leader and executive, but also was on the board of the Equitable the Insurance Company. And so Hughes, the counsel says, to Harriman, it has been openly charged that through your relations with former Governor Benjamin O'Dell, New York governor, you have political influence. And Harriman replied with sort of a sly, contemptuous humor, well, I should think that Mr. O'Dell had political influence because of his relations with me. And in saying those words, he essentially proved Hughes' point. It was widely quoted. Um, and it kind of, again, illustrated the enormous political power uh, of this industry. In fact, if you look at the hearings, it comes back again and again and again to the question of undue political influence. And the committee that ran the investigation, the legislature uh, ultimately recommended among other things, prohibiting life insurers from making campaign contributions of any kind. It was one of the first such acts. Uh, and it was a proposal that was duly passed and became law in New York state in 1906. So 20 years later, and just one more example, but I think an even more important example, Congress was debating whether to create a federal radio commission. Broadcast radio was quite new. And the question was, did this need to be regulated? And one of the core lines of argument, perhaps the dominant argument, was that extensive regulation of radio broadcasting was necessary to protect the integrity of the nation's political system. It was 
first and foremost, a political question. You know, there were many other issues as well, including how to protect against interference on the airwaves, but protecting the political system turned out to be paramount. And so what lawmakers were saying is just think what would happen if it, to American democracy, if, uh, if a small number of people ever got control over the radio spectrum, whether in the nation as a whole, at a regional level, at a local level, in a particular town or community. For these lawmakers, again and again, the question of whether market power leads to political power, particularly in the, ca ca in the context of radio broadcasting, seemed almost blindingly obvious. And so just to drive this point home, um, I'm going to abuse maybe my time just for a minute here. I want to quote, actually at some length, the words of a representative from Texas, Representative Luther Johnson, who spoke about uh, the, the radio bill on the House floor in 1926. And I think his words have some relevance to, to, to what we're talking about today, but I think also have some particular resonance with some of the new communications technologies that we're struggling with and their uh, economic concentration in those areas and the political impact. So here's radio, which was relatively new, just so you get a sense of the timing. The first broadcast radio station uh, was formed in 1920. So this is really quite new by 1926. And this is Representative Luther A. Johnson of Texas. So he says on the floor of the house, there is no agency so fraught with possibilities for service of good or evil to the American people as the radio. As a means of entertainment, education, information, and communication, it has limitless possibilities. The power of the press will not be comparable to that of the broadcasting stations when the industry is fully developed. If the development continues as rapidly in the future as in the past, it will only be a few years before these broadcasting stations, if operated by chain stations, will simultaneously reach an audience of over half of our entire citizenship and bring messages to the fireside of nearly every home in America. They can mold and crystallize sentiment as no agency in the past has been able to do. If the strong arm of the law does not prevent monopoly ownership and make discrimination by such stations illegal, American thought and, Mer and American politics will be largely at the mercy of those who operate these stations. For publicity is the most powerful weapon that can be wielded in a republic. And when such a weapon is placed in the hands of one or a single selfish group is permitted to either tacitly or otherwise acquire ownership and dominate these broadcasting stations throughout the country, then woe be to those who dared to differ with them. It will be impossible to compete with them in reaching the ears of the American public. And then he actually brought in a quick economic analysis. He said subsidy, and by which I think he meant cross subsidy of radio broadcasting would be far more effective and dangerous than subsidy of the press. And by that he meant the, the print press. For if every newspaper in the United States could be purchased by some trust or combination, independent and competing newspapers could be established. But if the broadcasting stations, which are necessarily limited in number, can be acquired or even a majority of the high powered stations owned and controlled by a trust, then the public will be helpless to establish others unless the government protects them in this right. Last sentence, freedom of the air will be impossible if the government either licenses or permits monopoly ownership of radio sending stations. Now, Representative Johnson was a Democrat. But the Republicans were saying more or less the same thing. To lawmakers across the spectrum, the idea that economic concentration could prove politically dangerous, particularly in radio broadcasting, but also well beyond that, this seemed, as I said, blindingly obvious. And my sense though, and this is just where I want to end, my sense is that this may have seemed less obvious or perhaps just of less interest to many lawmakers as the 20th century wore on, particularly after World War II, if you look at policy debates at the federal level and at the state level, particularly at the federal, however, I would say that a great many policy debates on a range of issues, including broadcast regulation and antitrust and many others, became much more focused on economic efficiency than on the health of the polity or on the democracy as compared to earlier times. And not that there's anything wrong with efficiency, but I do sometimes wonder whether the increased focus on economics and economic efficiency in public policy discussions over the post-war period, for all of the great benefits that that analysis delivered, whether that change of focus may have at the same time crowded out or maybe dulled that keen awareness of the economic foundations of politics that Hofstadter wrote about and that so long characterized American policy policymaking. So sorry to go on a little too long and I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, David. Uh, Jim, why don't you bring your international view on this. 
Yeah, well, my, my view may be that, you know, if what David is espousing is the conventional wisdom about the United States. I, I'd say that my view is very heterodox uh, in the sense that I don't study the United States, but every country I study, I'd say you should think of the causality as the other way around. It's politics that creates market power. And, and yes, you can imagine logically feedback from market power to politics. You know, money is useful for doing politics, but it's not the big story at all. You know, let me, let me give you an example uh, that I know something about from Colombia. In Colombia, if you've been to Colombia and you've had some beer, it's almost certainly been Bavaria, made by Bavaria. 97% uh, of beer consumed in Colombia uh, is made by Bavaria. So that sounds like a lot of market power. Okay, so let me tell you the history of Bavaria, okay, and what's the relationship between Bavaria and politics. The origins of Bavaria in 1889, it was started by a German emigre called Leo Kopp. And Kopp, you know, he came with human capital from Bavaria, and he started a brewery. Uh, and, you know, he started eliminating the opposition. So at that time, there were lots of different breweries, independent breweries, there were other Germans, there were all sorts of people. Uh, he started eliminating them one by one. Uh, his sort of, he died in the 1920s and his, his, answer, you know, his, his successors carried on this. It took them a long time and it was only really in the 1960s when Bavaria was taken over, over by Julio Mario Santo Domingo who became, until Carlos Slim you know, got going, uh, Santo Domingo was the richest man uh, uh, in Latin America. And he ruthlessly eliminated the rest of the opposition, you know, with wonderful strategies, you know, buying up the bottling plant so that one company couldn't get any bottles to make beer or buying up all the land around another company. So they, he basically kind of throttled them. That was the last independent brewery. And what were the politicians doing? The politicians were, were letting them do this. You know, I mean, the, the, the best moment uh, is, was in 1948, in May of 1948 when uh, the conservative government finally did what Bavaria really wanted, which was they made chicha illegal. So chicha is like artisanal maize beer, you know. Uh, you can still buy it in Colombia. I wouldn't recommend the experience, but anyway, it was made illegal in 1948. That, that was the sort of fringe competition that you couldn't really buy up, you know, and it was really difficult to cope with, okay? And that was made illegal one month after its protector was assassinated, who was a liberal politician called Jorge Eliese Gaitan. He was a sort of populist. He liked chicha. He used to frequent the chicherias in Bogota, and he was assassinated one month later. They made chicha illegal, okay? So, so were these people connected to politics? They were connected. You know, Santo Domingo's mother was a cousin of Alfonso Lopez Pumarejo, who was a conservative, a liberal president in the 1930s and then in 1942. So yeah, they were connected to politics. Did they put money into politics? Yeah, they put lots of money into politics, but politics could get rid of them tomorrow if it wanted to, just in the same way as Putin got rid of Khodorkovsky. You know, how did Mikhail Khodorkovsky get so rich in Russia? He was a crony of Yeltsin. He was a Yeltsin insider. He benefited from all the corruption and cronyism during the Yeltsin regime. He was the richest man in Russia. What happened to him? Nothing. He went to prison. He's in exile. The same thing would happen to Santo Domingo, the Santo Domingo clan. Julio Mario Santo Domingo passed away. He has three or four billionaires successors. Okay. So, so, you know, my view is that politics is sort of driving this. Politics creates these markets, you know, creates market power, creates what I'd call extractive economic institutions. That's a nice way of generating, generating rents and resources for yourself. You do need money to do politics, but what politics gives, politics uh, could take away again. So, so I understand, you know, logically the mechanisms from market power to politics. And I think maybe this is something to do with the very different types of political system. You know, the US is a very different type of political system it's much more rule-based. Uh, the institutions work much better than they do in Colombia. It's much less patrimonial. There's something about the logic of Colombian politics, but I, you know, I wouldn't say this is just Colombia. This is also about Latin America. If I talked about Africa, I'd tell you the same story. How do you become a monopolist? How do you get market power in Nigeria? You know, because, because the politicians let you do it. So, so, so my view is that's the kind of flow of the of the of the causality here, you know, and um, I should probably shut up now, shouldn't I? 
no, you can you can go if you want, but I think you made your point uh, very yeah. clear. I don't see a, a gigantic difference between the two because uh, to some extent, when you say you let them do, is they have the power to influence so that nobody intervenes along the way. Since they could have stopped uh, uh, Bavaria monopoly much before, they didn't. Why? Because it was very influential. So I think that uh, there's not a lot of difference, but I, I think the point you're raising on the institutions are very important. So speaking of institution, let's go to Sarah, who is uh, an expert, particularly of the US contemporary institutions. So why don't we talk about that? Sure, that sounds good. And Professor Robinson, your talk made me want like a big Bavarian beer to celebrate the end of this conference. So maybe after we're done, we can all like sit back and have a cold one. Um, first of all, thanks so much for, for inviting me. I've learned so much from watching previous conferences over the years, and it really is a privilege to be a part of this one, particularly on such an important topic. Uh, just to give kind of viewers a little bit of background, since I might be new in my organization, might be new to them. Um, I've spent a little bit less than 20 years working uh, mostly in DC in politics at the Treasury Department in sort of big progressive think tanks that focus on economic and social policy adjacent to, to progressive governments and on a few presidential campaigns. Uh, and I started getting interested in antitrust and corporate power back in 2014 when I was on a project uh, uh, working for a project called the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, which you're probably familiar with, that was really exploring kind of underlying drivers of structural inequality. So we'd come out of a big financial crisis in the US and we hadn't really seen a very equitable recovery in the aftermath of that crisis. And so there was increasing attention on well, what are kind of the underlying structural causes of some of these social problems in the economy that are you know, contributing to this massive rise in wealth at the top and the stagnation uh, along the, the kind of bottom tiers. And through those kind of conversations, thought exercises, and as an alum of the University of Chicago, where I was taught fabulous critical thinking skills, uh, I started to just get really curious about monopolies as something that I never really heard talked about, or antitrust as a set of policy tools that I'd never heard talked about um, in any kind of conversation with even kind of quite high level economic policy thinkers and uh, government officials. So that kind of led me down a path of research and exploration. And I discovered uh, a number of other experts who you've uh, had on your panels. Uh, and we kind of got to a point where, uh, you know, we, we, I realized, we realized that um, antitrust was kind of, had kind of been put in a very, very narrow lane, uh, kind of constructed around efficiency uh, and was still being practiced in large part um, along an ideal, ideal, ideological line that, you know, Bork and Reagan had kind of set out. And I found that really weird. Like in other areas of policy, we don't really follow Robert Bork's lead on the progressive side. So why, why is that really the, the deep intellectual foundation for antitrust from a, from a progressive perspective? I, find, I found that very confusing and puzzling. And now I think we're in the middle of a, of a, of a fascinating, important, uh, robust debate about the point of antitrust law. And it gets into this conversation and ironically, being the one kind of non-professor here, I have slides to share with some research that we've been doing on this question. Um, but that debate is kind of centered around the kind of traditional libertarian Borkian approach, a modified version of that, which still really relies on the rule of reason and judicial discretion uh, and sort of efficiency and consumer prices, maybe with some other, you know, kind of considerations trying to be squished in there. Uh, and then a new structuralist approach. And I think that's the approach that has the air kind of under its wings right now. Um, that's looking to really set clear rules for market participants, set clear rules for judges um, and bring into antitrust uh, additional dimensions that don't just focus on price, don't just focus on what is often vague and, uh, and wrong kind of notions of efficiency that aren't borne out later, right? Uh, and antitrust as a way to decentralize economic power because of the dangers that it poses to democracy. So I'm super quickly going to just share my screen and walk through a couple of slides. Let's see. So we uh, are in the process of finishing a study. So the study looks at three kind of sectors. 
And it basically tracks, I think uh, Professor Valetti uh, presented kind of a similar type of study and approach in his talk that I was watching the other night. But basically we, we, we looked at three sectors and then we tied uh, kind of those sectors and uh, market concentration to increases in lobbying spending. And this is just lobbying. It's not donations to campaigns. It's not election spending. You know, it's not kind of soft influence spending on think tanks or other things. It's just straight up straightforward lobbying. So we found a correlation that's kind of in synchro uh, synchronization looks like this. And this is for internet companies. So this is Google, Oracle, Amazon, Netflix, uh, kind of large public companies. Uh, so a relatively young industry. And then when we actually shifted the timeline back a little bit, we found that uh, the trends tracked like this. So this has shifted back four years. When we looked at pharma, this is what a trend looked like kind of in, in synchrony. This is what it looked like offset three years. Interesting to note that it rose when concentration rose and it fell when concentration fell. Same with oil and gas, very old, concentrated, investment heavy industry. And then that's what it looks like with the four year offset. So obviously I think there's certainly room for more research in this area. Uh, no question about that, but it does sort of confirm our view, especially when you take into account that we know business lobbying is very effective. It is effective in uh, benefiting the individual firms. It's effective in benefiting the overall kind of winners in the economy through procurement, through trade, through tax cuts, through antitrust, all of this. Uh, we have research confirming all of this, but it just goes to show that concentrations in political and economic power have political impacts. And when you think about that in a pragmatic way, and you look back at say the large package of tax cuts that were passed a few years ago under the Trump administration, it becomes, I think, pretty easy to draw a line between excessive concentrations of power and outcomes that tend to be even worse for everyday workers, everyday small business people, everyday entrepreneurs who do not have those kinds of resources. So you see kind of concentrations of economic power and political power building on itself. So I'll stop there so we have plenty of time for discussion and debate, uh, but thought these charts, we, we, were, we were honestly like quite surprised to see these, these kind of track in the way that they do. And our thinking was that, you know, once an industry starts to consolidate, there's a time of readjustment and then that does end up, uh, that does get kind of spun into additional investments in, in uh, influencing government because you don't need to spend as much research, uh, resources competing and innovating and actually, uh, you know, uh, addressing challenges within the market sector that you operate in. Thank you, Sarah. And I find it very much in line with what uh, Jim was saying. This would be the story of the Bavaria Bia is that as they consolidate, they become more influential and that more influence give them more market power that gives them even more lobbying and so on and so forth. I actually label this uh, the Medici vicious circle because uh, the Medici family was one of the first to, to play this game in a very successful way in Florence during the Renaissance. Uh, but David, you were mentioning uh, a very famous investigation of uh, uh, the life insurance industry. If I'm not mistaken, in that investigation, uh, also uh, was found out that Theodore Roosevelt received some uh, uh, inappropriate campaign contribution and that uh, sort of uh, favor uh, the introduction of the Tillman Act that was uh, one of the first uh, campaign finance laws. So to what extent, what are the tools that we have available to reduce uh, uh, this power, uh, both in, in theory and in practice under the limit of the current interpretation of the Constitution? So, um, so that's a big question. Uh, I think actually the you know issue with Roosevelt was just a couple years later, but um, but right, he uh, he campaigned, was taking corporate money, claimed he wasn't, uh, believed he wasn't, I think, and then just uh, discovered that he that he was. Um, but in in any event, um, let me just quickly take a quick aside and then come back to your question, which is, you know, I think the point that Jim was raising, I might give that 
at least from my reading, more, more credence that the distinction means something. I mean that, um, you know, if you look in the United States, basically pre-1850, where there was specific incorporation law, I think it's probably pretty fair to say that it was the political system, as, as Jim's basically saying, um, was dominating, uh, was sort of calling the shots. And that the, the corruption, to the extent that it ran, it ran from the political system to the economic system. Um, but I think that after the rise of general incorporation law, and, and particularly important was New York in 1838, they, they come up with free banking laws, so um, general incorporation for banking. And that really changes the game. And of course, the political system could take that away at any moment, but there was an increasing norm of not doing that. And, and once that norm is set, um, and there's some independence on the part of the market, I think then this kind of dynamic of market power increasingly sort of influencing politics rather than the other way around um, becomes more, more of the standard causation. So I, again, we could argue about this a lot, but my sense is that there were some institutional changes and norm changes that were important. I guess just really quickly on, on your question, uh, I, I guess I would maybe depart a little bit. I think there are a lot of policies, hopefully within the constitution that could be used for addressing concentration. Um, I guess what I was actually trying to get at is that equally important and something we often forget is that we need to strengthen or really revitalize our under, underlying culture of democracy. And that that sort of belief is incredibly infor, important to blunting, um, to sort of blunting the, the power of, uh, of uh, uh, market power and, and, its, and its conversion into political influence. So just as maybe a quick illustration of that, I, I cited this radio regulation stuff. I wrote two papers and then, a, and then a case on early radio regulation. And after I published the first paper in 2003, I received, um, I'm not gonna use any names, but um, I know uh, Luigi and Jim, you know, you know this person, but um, I received an unsolicited critique um, from a brilliant professor at the University of Chicago Law School. And the professor said um, very kindly, but said he was baffled by my paper. And the paper um, uh, attempted to show that lawmakers in 1926 believed really vehemently that the spectrum should remain in the hands of the federal government and that it should be licensed to private actors but not sold to them. Um, and that this would help to prevent the possi possibility of excessive concentration in radio broadcasting. And the purpose again of preventing that concentration was to protect the integrity of the political system. So this professor from the University of Chicago Law School said he was baffled because government ownership of the airwaves wasn't necessary. That private property could be regulated to any degree desired and concentration among private owners could be limited, including through antitrust policy. So how, was it be, how could it be that resistance to privatization of the airwaves in 1926 had anything to do with fears about economic concentration in the industry and its political implications? He was saying that it was just simply uh, a way of, prevent, of, of defending incumbents, that it was a corrupt deal. Um, and that actually sort of very much in line with what Jim would be saying. I, I think though he got it wrong because if you look at what the lawmakers were doing in 1926 is, you know, I think they actually believed that handing, um, handing the airwaves over to the government and not allowing private ownership was the only way to protect the integrity of the political system. And if you look, these included some extremely conservative members of Congress who under no other circumstances ever wanted to turn over private property uh, to, to the government. And if in fact, this was all just a corrupt deal, why didn't they believe in government ownership of just about everything else? And so I would say without ever hearing from an economist at Chicago or anywhere else, that economic power might beget political power. These lawmakers had really a visceral reaction against concentration in radio broadcasting because of this deeply rooted commitment to the idea of political competition. This wasn't run through antitrust policy or any other fine grained policy. Rightly or wrongly, I would say this visceral reaction translated into a resistance to privatizing the airwaves. Again, quite a remarkable instinct given what these lawmakers were doing in other domains. And the point is, I think that without their visceral instinct on this issue, it's just not clear that the sort of fine grained regulation that my very esteemed sparring partner from the University of Chicago Law School suggested would have sufficed, whether that would ever have come into being. The reasoning that the members of Congress articulated for the radio bill in 1926, that reasoning might not have been up to University of Chicago standards 
but it was their instinctive anxiety, I think, about the potential political power of radio that helped put a strategy against concentration in the radio industry on the agenda and have it translated into law virtually from day one. And so I guess this is why, in answer to your question, Luigi, it, it's why I think actually strengthening and revitalizing kind of our broader culture of democracy is really as important as anything else we can do in safeguarding the integrity of the political system against market power or any other kind of threat. Um, and so I'm not sure that the only thing we need to do is figure out how to have a, a better policy scalpel. I think there's something else we need as, as well. And those instincts of the lawmakers in 1926 is something we should be trying to cultivate more, more broadly. So again, I went on too long, but, but there you go. No, no David, that, that was very, very useful, but not, not to dismiss uh, what you're suggesting, the power of uh, revitalizing democracy, which is called, of course is very important. But I think that uh, what I hear you saying, and tell me if, I, if I'm wrong, what I hear you saying is that uh, maybe we can put uh, those intuition in a more formal way, because when I hear you talking, the 1926 uh, legislators were thinking of if we uh, privatize and then regulate, this is time inconsistency, inconsistent because over time, uh, the private entity will have so much power that will overturn the regulation and the outcome it will be worse. So that uh, a government ownership of the airways, in a sense, is uh, a, a more time consistent rule than uh, a, an auction. Is, is that what you're suggesting? Yes, I mean, in fact, they were thinking very much along those lines. But I would also say that they were looking at ways of preventing concentration far beyond just a specific. So for example, they saw antitrust policy and they thought it wasn't gonna be very effective in this, in this context. So they were trying to build another structure to deal with this particular uh, type of concentration. And I think that their instinct of wanting to build that, uh, had it not been in existence, my sense is we would have seen a very different outcome. That's fascinating. I, I'm gonna go around, but I wanna sort of plant a, a question so that you think along the, the time, is how this uh, sensitivity disappear in the United States and why? Uh, Jim. You're asking me a question about the- No, United no, no, sorry. That's a question for David. The, the question for you is about, uh, so what institutions are uh, designed? And if you, and, and I agree with you and David that basically it's a subtle equilibrium in which in most countries, business dominates everything. In some countries, government dominates everything and you want kind of a balance of power. And uh, how do you achieve that balance of power? Yeah, well, I think I think David and I agreeing that, that this is mostly about politics. You know, politics isn't just about money. You know, like let me give you another Colombian example. You know, or even mostly about money. There's a supermarket chain in Colombia called Olimpica. You know, that's not a monopoly. There's competition, but the the owner of Olimpica is very proud of, of telling everyone how he tells his workers who to vote for. You know, and that's what Bavaria also brought. You know, Leo Kopp was a patron, he delivered votes, you know, not just money, you know. Uh, so, 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 you know, you mobilize votes, like, you know, we, 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 in Western countries, we're very, you know, we're very fixated on money and, you know, we think that money is the, the causes everything, you know, but, but in Africa, they'd say there's wealth in people, you know, and Colombia is a sort of hybrid, you know, between in Africa and the United States. And uh, you know, you need people and, 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 and political skills and politics is, is more than just money. It's about social relations and mobilizing people. And so I would say, you know, the problem, I would agree with David, you know, there's beautiful antitrust laws in Colombia. You know, maybe you, Luigi, you wrote them. I don't know, like somebody from the University no. of Chicago wrote them. You know, they're beautiful antitrust laws. It's just that nobody has any incentive to enforce them. You know, there's no popular pressure that will enforce them. None of the politicians want to enforce them. I don't know why they have them. Maybe the Inter-American Development Bank gave them some money to pass some antitrust laws or the World Bank or something, you know. So that's not, that's not a margin which is going to kind of do anything to this equilibrium in Colombia. I think you have to have, you have to have political, political change, you know, but, but, and you have to try to make the system less clientelistic, you know, and more open and accountable and more inclusive. But obviously that's a, you know, that's not something that one has a magic wand for. You know, you could say, if I look at the, you know, one of my Colombian friends says, you know, the, 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 the country progresses at night, you know, like you don't, you don't see it ever, but, but slowly, slowly, slowly it progresses, you know. And, and, and I think, you know, I think if you looked in Latin America and you asked, 
you know, where have things moved the most, you know, in a kind of more inclusive direction or whatever, then, you know, it's the places where there's, where there's more social change, where there's more popular mobilization, you know, it's, it's, it's Bolivia, for example, you know, it's, you know, and so I, I'm not sure I have an institutional solution to that because, because I, you know, I don't, I mean, this is not, this is a very weakly institutionalized context, you know, so, so I, it's not clear to me you change the equilibrium in Colombia by, by, you know, that helps, it helps a little bit, but it, it's, it's a very blunt tool for solving these problems. So I thought that you were about extracting institutions, that the, the initial uh, legal framework had a long-term consequence. Uh, it's, it's not, you have changed your mind on that? No, but it's not the legal framework. The institutional framework is not the legal framework. The institutional framework is much broader than that. Sure, no, that's exactly right. But extractive political institutions are, you know, that's an equilibrium which is very hard to move. You can't move that by, that's not about the constitutional writing laws or, you know, that's about power. It's about social mobilization. It's about collective mobilization. You know, what is it that, you know, has kind of changed the equilibrium in Bolivia that's, you know, that's the collective mobilization of indigenous people, I'd say, you know, what has changed many things in Peru, for example, that's, that's the kind of emergence of new identities and, 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 you know, in the coast. And so, so I, you know, that, that I think that's, you know, the story that we have about what creates political change is, 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 you know, is collective mobilization by people who suffer from extractive institutions but that's you know as we know in economics from the theory of the collective action problem that's that's something that's very difficult to to achieve uh, in these societies so thank you sarah uh, so what are your views on what can be done to improve uh, the u.s institutions sure so let me give you kind of like a practical state of play as I see it. I think there's two sides to this and they're ideally kind of brought together in a virtuous circle. So kind of drawing off of David's remarks. I think what we have seen over the past six, seven years in terms of kind of the political consciousness of the broader population is a slow coming together of a lot of rage at special interests, lobbying, kind of corruption in government that hasn't really been fully channeled. I mean, like you've see, you, we have seen certainly Trump rise as, as semi, semi-populist, although he didn't govern like that and didn't, I don't think, distill a lot of political power from that kind of economic populism at the end of the day. Uh, you've seen that on the, on the left as well. And then, you know, I think among kind of the business community, you've seen this shift from, you know, six or seven years ago when you talk to people, you know, in policy who let's say they were running a failing business or they were struggling, they wouldn't really recognize the kind of structural impediments or the anti-competitive practices that were undermining their business. There was really a, if I don't succeed, if I don't pull myself up by my bootstraps and I failed on my own merits, there just wasn't a consciousness around what we call like economic what, what freedoms should you have from fri- private power as an actor in the market? And that has changed, I think, quite rapidly, where you see are in business, who are our working people, who are seeing this massive imbalance of power, this extractive power, uh, Jim, as you talk about, and are feeling politically motivated by that. I, th- I think on the institutional side in Washington, and I was just uh, one of my colleagues at Economic Liberties was just testifying in the House Judiciary Committee this morning. You obviously have seen, I think, this rapid growth in awareness around antitrust and monopoly power more generally, and the connection that it has to democratic sustainability and uh, creating more equitable outcomes. So that's all been really capitalized by uh, big tech in particular and Facebook and the just steady stream of disasters that their market power and business model has caused. Uh, But I think we're gonna ideally start to see a virtuous circle between kind of a body politic that is more activated by the connection of, I don't know if you can, my internet's a little bit shaky today, by the connection of kind of corruption, lobbying, special interests, which has long animated profoundly uh, and monopoly corporate power. And that will kind of feed more into the political system and I think hopefully drive more aggressive reform. So I, I, you know, I think it's quite remarkable uh, how quickly the debate has moved, how quickly that has uh, translated into legislative activity in Congress into kind of norms around enforcement. Uh, And now I think we're gonna put that to the test. So there's a body of organizations now that are 
including mine, that is working to kind of hold policymakers and enforcers accountable to do that public education and to really lay the kind of day-to-day -day groundwork to shape kind of, I think, what is it's like a gut awareness in a lot of the population. For example, 60% of Republicans voters support breaking up Facebook, 56% of Democrats do. You know, that's a, there's not a lot of issues where you find that sort of agreement. Uh, and use that to actually enforce real policy change and change laws, change enforcement patterns that start to put a lid on uh, at least hopefully concentration from accelerating and ideally start to take steps to deconcentrate the economy, particularly in key abusive sectors. So I kind of look at this from a very practical lens. We need to kind of capitalize and shape, I think what is already a lot of awareness and anger in the broader population translate that into political context. So we have more leaders who are willing to embrace these ideas and we have more enforcers and policymakers uh, who are willing to actually stake some political capital on them. Thank you. So, so David, let me go back to you and with a question I initially asked, which was uh, uh, what happened in the United States that this tradition that was so prevalent in 1926 kind of uh, vanished uh, and now is being resurrected. But if you were to look at uh, the 90s, uh, nobody was sort of a champion in this position, neither Republicans nor Democrats. So what happened? Yeah, so, I mean, it's hard to say, obviously, but when I sort of look just in reading policy debates, the changeover seems to be pretty soon after World War II. So you don't even have to get to the 90s. I mean, even already by the 50s, if you look at, for example, debates, just to be consistent here, at broadcast regulation or financial regulation, or, there's a much more technical turn. And there's an idea, I mean, basically, there's a, there's a great respect for social science, actually. Um, and there's a sense of trying to figure out how do we do this in the most efficient way. So, you know, COSA's idea about spectrum allocation um, and, you know, uh, auctioning off and so on, those ideas of, are, are extremely prevalent and, and should be, right? Brilliant contribution. But at the same time, what becomes really evident is that these sort of um, discussions of democracy are sort of put to the side, much, much less. They're just much less visible in the debates. And, my, and you're saying why? I think that after the depression and the war, economists and sort of the focus on economic efficiency and economic growth just loomed a lot larger. And there was almost, it was almost something like a little bit quaint about the lawmaker who would, you know, bang on the drum of democracy. Like it seemed a little unsophisticated. And, you know, here we are, we really understand policy analysis and so on. And in a sense, what was happening, I think, is that we had spent a lot of time building up some institutions and norms. We'd come to take them for granted. And then we essentially could live on them. We could sort of free ride on them for a while. But you actually start to see you know, the evidence is pretty clear that by the 19, already by the late 1970s, um, public faith in democracy has actually declined quite considerably. Not just public faith in the federal government, that's not really the right indicator. It's faith in democracy, faith in each other, faith in other, you know, et cetera. That, if you look at those measures, they're all coming down in the 80s and the 90s, and they've kept coming down. And so I would say that there was sort of an organized taking for granted these institutions and these norms that have been created of the kind that Jim was talking about as well. Um, and, uh, and, and sort of a, a tremendous focus on kind of the, the tactics and the kind of technical side of policymaking, extremely important. But if we lose the health of the political system, you're in desperate shape. So I think that there's now maybe an increasing appreciation of that, um, but that would be my rough sense of the timing and maybe causation, but it's, it's vague, I'll, I'll acknowledge that, yeah. So, Jim, you, you talk about mobilization and uh, is uh, clearly a very important issue, but we've seen a lot of episodes of mobilization that think about uh, the Arab Spring, um, or even what I consider one of the most massive form of mobilization, the five-star uh, movement in Italy that went from nothing to 35% of the votes, in, in, uh, in ten, less than 10 years. Um, but those mobilizations don't seem to really produce long-term sustainable change. So um, what it takes for mobilization to succeed, because I, I am with Sarah, there is a change in spirit in the United States, but uh, my fear, and this is my Italian pessimist, so I apologize, but 
My fear is that uh, after all this great excitement, everything vanishes like the air of spring. So what is your view? Yeah, I think it takes a certain sort of mobilization. I mean, you know, the generalization that we have, you know, in why nations fail is, you know, we want this is what we call a kind of broad coalition. I mean, I think, you know, if you looked at, uh, if you look at the Arab Spring, the one place, you know, where you could say the Arab Spring really did bear fruit. I mean, I think you're right that the Arab Spring is a fabulous example of how difficult it is to shift extractive institutions. But the one place where, where there really was some progress was Tunisia, you know, in some sense. In Tunisia, they got rid of Ben Ali, you know, and they, and they created something much more functional and open. And I think that has something to do with the nature, the very different nature of society. You know, there was a trade union movement in, 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 in Tunisia. You know, there were women's movements. There was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't just kind of discontented children of elites or whatever. You know, it was a, just a different type of society. And I guess that's why I sort of mention, you know, social change. I mean, this not a, you know, I'm not a sociologist and, you know, but, 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 but you know, but, but it seems to me the places where you have more change in, in on, on hope for change in Latin America is where there is social change. And sometimes that's got, not, you know, it's not, that's not being driven by anything that I usually talk about. You know, I don't think the emergence, for example, in Peru of this kind of Cholo identity, which is so kind of exciting politically and economically, has anything to do with, with you know, institutions in some sense. It's a much more sociological process. You know, if you look in Peru, you look kind of 30 years ago when Alan Garcia was president, he had these people called the 10 apostles who were like 10 business tycoons who he tried to kind of cozy up to. They're all like white kind of descendants of Italian immigrants, you know, he'd set up these monopolies and whatever. If you look, there's a recent book published last year by a, Peru, a Peruvian sociologist called like the 10 New Apostles. Half of them are now what they call Cholo, you know, and what's interesting about Cholo is that used to be a very pejorative word if you're a Cholo, you know, it was like an indigenous person who kind of tried to fit in with white Creole society. But now it's like, it's a badge of, you know, it's been taken as a badge of honor, you know, and half of the 10, the new 10 apostles, half of them are self-identify as cholos, you know, so there's social change, there's dramatic social change, which is extremely inclusive. And so, so I think, you know, that's something I would say distinguishes Tunisia from the other types of society. So, 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 you know, I don't, we don't, I don't have a great generalization about the circumstances under which these broad coalitions emerge. That's, that's, you know, that's the difference between, I guess I would say, I don't know much about the five star movement. So I hesitate to talk about that, but, but the cases that I see where you do see where mobilization leads to something different, that seems to be, it seems to be something about the nature of the society and the coalition that mobilizes. But can you tell this a bit exactly? This is exposed. It's very easy to identify what made a difference. But if I were to start uh, a movement in uh, uh, Peru or in, um, in Ecuador, uh, can you tell me which one is more likely to be successful? Well, I don't know. You know, this is induction. This is a complicated problem. I don't think we have good theories of, you know, institutional transition or institutional change. I think, you know, the first, the, you know, the null hypothesis is that of immense kind of persistence. You know, I think, you know, I think that the, which is a, which is a sort of, which is a good thing, you know, for, for someone living in the United States in the last four years, the thought of persistence has been a, been a nice thought you know so 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 i you know i think you know we we don't have good theories i'm you know i'm giving you a kind of an inductive generalization from like things that i've studied but you know like could i tell ex ante when that type of coalition is going to emerge i i don't have a theory about that i i, I wish i did you know uh so no you know but this is you're asking a lot oh i know i know but from you uh, that's the least i can ask right uh, Sa Sarah, um, I think you brilliantly made you dodge my question because I wanted to have more practical solutions. So suppose this coalition comes together and uh, sort of uh, what can they propose to make a difference? What they can do to avoid that uh, uh, they become like another Egyptian Arab Spring and they become a Tunisian Arab Spring? Go, go. Go with that question one more time. You broke up a little so, bit. So the me. question is, um, 
if you need to translate this uh, exciting movement into political action, what are the one, two, three political action you would like this movement to uh, deliver to make it a long-term difference? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that in this respect, you know, there's some pretty basic tactics and maybe it's a little bit boring for, for this panel that you need to be prepared to do. You need to reward elected leaders who take a stand on these issues and risk political capital at the ballot box. You need to make sure that they're rewarded, that these are winning issues, that they feel supported and that they feel protected in what is going to be an onslaught of campaign spending, almost certainly against them when they're up for re-election. I don't think it takes 535 anti-monopolist leaders you know, on, in the House, but I do think that it takes certainly a handful of strategic uh, committed uh, politicians who know how to operate successfully and know how to legislate. I think on the executive side, uh, you know, civil society is just in such a different place than it was, you know, for example, when Obama was inaugurated in office in 2009 in the aftermath of the financial crisis. You know, I think there is a robust civil society movement that is beginning to really see uh, taking on monopoly power as integral to achieving broader social justice oriented outcomes. And they're, they're kind of increasingly uh, able to deploy political power in ways that can counteract uh, some of the lobbying and the soft influence peddling that these corporations try to do on their behalf. I think just the progress that we've seen in the last two years, you know, certainly on tech indicates that. I think, you know, Jim Jordan, who's a ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee just this morning, who's been very unserious on tech monopoly issues, uh, engaged in an aggressive line of questioning towards the Republican witness about why, why shouldn't Google be broken up? You know, I mean, it's just, I gotta tell you, it's just remarkable to see uh, things shift so rapidly and uh, kind of policymakers and elites in DC kind of relearn this language of antitrust as it was more traditionally thought of. And the point being, it's a safeguard and a check for democracy. And it's really underpinned this broad-based growth of the middle class that's been so central to that. So I, I, you know, we need more champions, they need to be rewarded. We need to expose, I think a lot of the, the kind of tactics and corruption that a lot of these corporations engage in and it has to fit together with a broader democracy reform initiative. So I think this goes hand in hand with things like with, with policy initiatives like HR1 that attempt to broaden democracy in ways that doesn't, that, that, that don't touch on kind of corporate power but it is an essential complement to that. Thank you. So let me start opening up for questions. Uh, there are a lot of them in the queue. I pick one that um, is particularly linked to what uh, Sarah just uh, uh, said, and uh, also I think is uh, very much in the area of expertise of David. So the question is, does the increased U.S. public interest against uh, market power and monopolization eventually die in the U.S. Senate? Is it uh, the ideal institution for corporate interest to influence, given the small size protection of minority interest and massive costs of senatorial campaigns. So I have to reveal that uh, much of what I know about US history is working on a paper with David Mass uh, about, uh, uh, among other things, uh, the um, amendment, the constitutional amendment to make the Senate elective because uh, in the old days, the Senate was considered the chamber of the battle uh, of industrial interest. So uh, to David, uh, is the Senate uh, return to be the battle of industrial interest and uh, uh, how do we fix it? Yeah, so um, I, I hope not. Obviously, you know, to some extent um, that, that could well be true and could still be true. But, I, you know, what, what we found in that paper, um, which I still, uh, you know, I tend to think that that one was right, which is... Um, that, that there could be very, very strong corporate interests, uh, business interests basically dominating. We were looking at a few different things, but particularly um, if you look at the um, uh, certain, certain industries, the industry influence in, in the Senate, where that started to change in really quite a dramatic way is when the public became informed, uh, as, as you know, we wrote about, when the public became informed about, about the issue. So whether it was Upton Sinclair informing the public about um, the dangers in the meat industry or, you know, any one of a number of others. Uh, we, we also look particularly at the 17th Amendment and people 
uh, which was election of senators and people became aware of the degree of corruption in the Senate. Once the pub public becomes mobilized, um, it really changes the game dramatically. And uh, what could look like a very insider uh, Senate um, suddenly becomes much more responsive. And what we were able to show is that in the districts or in the states where penetration of muckraking investigative journal, uh, journalists, um, the penetration of those magazines was highest, that was where lawmakers were most likely to have flipped their vote from basically, uh, for example, from opposed to the 17th Amendment to for it, or uh, 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 you know, basically supporting a, a, an industrial interest to opposing. Um, and so they would flip their vote basically after some piece of investigative journalism had kind of exposed the problem. So I would say again, you know, the, the best answer to these things is to try to engage the public. And uh, you know, one of the reasons why I focused on, on radio and so on, the power of the media, the power of the press to inform the public about, about salient policy issues. And, and then is there a way to get them really engaged? When the public engages, the power of those interests, special interests definitely decline and all sorts of things I think become possible when they're not engaged in a sense very little is possible in, in almost any direction. So to the extent that your concern is economic concentration, do people, you know, I think there is more uh, mobilization about that. Is there enough? I guess that's the, the relevant um, question. But I, I would think about a, um, a public education strategy of trying to connect with the public in that way is maybe one of the most important things that, 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 you, could, that you could do. And I guess relates back to that paper that we once uh, worked on together. Uh, yeah, and, and to, uh, to be fair to you, David, you are working very hard to actually create this education to democracy in a lot of high school, and, and I think your, your work is fantastic. Um, as I said, I'm an Italian pessimist, so in spite of uh, the optimists in, in the joint paper, I'm concerned that in the current environment, uh, it, something like uh, what happened in, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century cannot be replicated because uh, media are not as free as they were before. So uh, I read recently that uh, now Facebook has decided to uh, eliminate uh, or censor some groups that are criticizing the NATO. Now, I'm in favor of the NATO, but it doesn't strike to me as uh, an issue that you have to eliminate people. So if the major media are, have the power to screen uh, uh, people that think differently, how can we uh, mobilize and uh, create a consensus, expose, uh, like uh, uh, David was saying? And this is mostly for, for you, Sarah, who are in the Beltway and you know uh, what's going on. How can, uh, can we prevent uh, the uh, two or three key digital platform to dictate what is allowed on the agenda and what is not? Yeah, that's... I mean, that's a great question. I think, you know, one of the scariest things about our current kind of political environment is the increasing concentration of communications, particularly online, but also on television and radio and all the rest of it, where, you know, we do see huge amounts of corporate ownership that's increasingly concentrated, uh, putting ideas out there and sort of execute, uh, uh, engaging in kind of gatekeep, gatekeeper activity. I think that is why we are uh, encouraged, hopefully, that, you know, the Biden administration can start taking action on tech platforms more quickly through things like FTC rulemakings. Uh, Congress is obviously moving forward quickly, increasingly on a bipartisan basis. And I think that, uh, you know, there are real opportunities here to make sure that smaller publishers can have a lifeline through a number of policy steps, whether that's through ensuring that they can collectively bargain with the large, larger platforms in the short term or pursuing breakups or changes in the way that uh, Google and Facebook in particular make their money currently through monopolizing digital advertising markets. So, uh, you know, one thing that does make me feel optimistic is the degree of sophistication with what a lot of policymakers now understand these problems and not just policymakers, influential civil society groups as well. Um, you know, it's one of the, the kind of top issues, I think, in our political discourse right now, and importantly so. So, you know, this isn't, this is not going to be solved overnight, but for a very long time, nobody was paying any attention to it at all. 
And I think now both the strength and kind of the bipartisan nature of the debate does make me feel like, you know, we will get a handle on this problem. One of the other reasons why that is, is because I think particularly in the case of Facebook and Google, there are so many other actors who are aligned against them that normally wouldn't be working together. So there is a, 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 a strong kind of political constituency of business people, entrepreneurs, publishers, racial justice advocates, economic justice advocates, you know, all down the line who are more or less singing the same tune. You know, these guys have way too much power and it's on you, it's on you to deal with them policymakers, you know, we're not asking them to fix themselves anymore. We are kind of past that stage of the conversation. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Arias Irales, and um, he reminds us that today is the anniversary of the People Power Revolution in the Philippines. And so since uh, Jim is an expert uh, in uh, around the world, uh, I would like, uh, he asked, uh, any thoughts regarding Marcos Cronis and the government succeeding Marcos? I will add uh, an element to that and say, in that uh, power balance between uh, uh, government, uh, uh, private interest, and uh, especially economic interest and mobilization, where does the Philippine uh, people power revolution fall in and what we have to learn from it? Yeah, well, I'm definitely not an expert on the Philippines. My impression about the Philippines is that, you know, there has the People's Power movement, which removed uh, Marcos from power and, you know, led to this re-democratization, you know, has, has, borne, has borne a lot of fruit, but it's been very difficult in the Philippines to build, build the state, to build, build institutions to provide basic public goods. You know, I mean, the appeal of President Duterte, actually, which, you know, you know, people emphasize a lot the kind of nutty side of his character. But if you know something about the history of Duterte, he was a fantastically successful mayor of Davao City in Mindanao. So Davao City got the reputation for being the safest, most functional place in the Philippines. And, you know, that was partially to do with the very brutal way he dealt with lawlessness and gangs. And, you know, and so, so I think, you know, that he became president because people in Manila thought, gosh, I'd like a bit of that here, you know, and that's actually all for real. I've been in Davao City and, you know, you can kind of eat your breakfast off the pavement. There's no, it's just an incredible place, you know, relative to the rest of the Philippines, especially relative to Mindanao, you know. Uh, so, so, so I think, you know, that's, that's a sort of response to, you know, to kind of people despairing at, you know, the disorder and lack of basic kind of public goods and, you know, and, and the transition to democracy, you know, in many ways, didn't overcome this very clientelistic way of doing politics in the in the Philippines. You know, there's a there's a beautiful argument in the Philippines that the origins of clientelism are the way the U.S. built the state in the colonial period. You know, they started with elections at the local level, and then they gradually, gradually, gradually scaled them up. So local politicians got really skilled, and then they kind of built these bigger machines from the bottom up. So I, you know, that's a difficult transition. I think in many democratic transitions, you see that it's very difficult to eradicate this clientelistic type of politics. It perpetuates itself and that creates all sorts of problems for institution building. And, and you know, people, people grasp for desperate solutions, you know, and, and that's what, you know, Duterte was, I think. So there's a question coming from John Lane that I particularly like, and I would like uh, David to answer. And, uh, is technocracy in government an enabler or an impediment to these types of pro-market, pro-democracy reforms? So um, I certainly hope it can be used as a, as um, in support of and an enabler, but I, I do think it can be an impediment. Um, you know, I, I, um, I remember being involved in one particular uh, sort of large regulatory issue and uh, you know the the policymakers who were trying to figure out what to do, I thought were doing you know quite a good job. And after they came up with a policy proposal, I just asked them, you know, I was sort of an outsider, and I just said, you know, what's your strategy for communicating with the public what you're trying to do? And their answer was, we don't we don't need to communicate with the public. We've got the votes in Congress. And I thought that that was actually sort of an indication 
that's where technocracy becomes an impediment because they thought sort of all that mattered was getting the right policy. And if the public doesn't understand it, and if the public's not behind it, it's not much of a policy. For one thing, Congress is going to, you know, power in Congress is going to change. But for another thing, that's not really where ultimately the power resides. And so um, my sense is to the extent that the technocracy feels like it is, it, it sees politics as a dirty word, and that it is supposed to be, you know, insulated and completely disengaged from public involvement and pu public pressure and public engagement, I would say then it's an impediment. To the extent that it sees its job as connecting, engaging with, with the broader public, explaining what it's doing, having a back and forth, and, you know, there are, there are a variety of ways to do that, including, you know, public, uh, almost like juries to, to, to make assessments and so on. Um, to the extent they see that, I think it's, it's an enabler of the kind of change that I think, you know, many people want to see in terms of strengthening, um, you know, small d, small r, Democratic and Republican um, institutions, but the institutions of self-governance. Uh, but, but again, to the extent they see themselves as really separated and insulated from, I think that unfortunately becomes more of an impediment. So, Sarah, Vinod Sharma asked, uh, is concentration of big monopolies and antitrust leading to rise in inequality, rise in government deficit, and too much resources being diverted towards which in form of monetary policy and fiscal stimulus? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm sure you all are familiar with some of this literature, too. I mean, beyond the kind of political external action that we talked about that's more generalized and abstract. We've seen studies, I think one coming out of the University of Chicago, actually others coming out of Harvard that show uh, for an average worker, uh, you know, their compensation is at a minimum $5,000 less, or I guess uh, purchasing power is $5,000 less than it would otherwise be in a more competitive marketplace. So we've seen this kind of economic research come out that shows that concentrated markets are very extractive to the average household and family. That's, you know, even $5,000 is quite, is quite a lot of money when an average take home pay uh, is roughly around 33,000 uh, per individual. So these are not small amounts of money uh, that are moving from workers to capital uh, because of corporate concentration. And it's uh, been, uh, we've seen even bigger, you know, estimates in other research since then. So I think that, you know, if you are, wanting to, to solve some of these problems, you have to both identify kind of the specific numbers like those, and then you have to look at the general consequence of kind of concentration, uh, concentration of risk in particular, like we can look at Texas and what happened there as an example, where kind of short-term changes in market structure to promote privatization or more concentrated structures has follow-on impacts that have very negative uh, on people's well-being, safety, or uh, the public purse. So I think that that's a you know I, th I think that we see you know for another thing that that we witness all the time are large corporate subsidies that go to Facebook or Google or Amazon or Boeing uh, to purportedly deliver great good-paying jobs and innovation, and those promises often very often fail to deliver. There is a big HQ2 fight in New York, obviously. Uh, a couple of years ago, which really drove that point home, how much of our public resources are spent subsidizing often monopolistic corporations, which then come into local communities and then can exert kind of tremendous political power over those local labor markets and lo local political systems. You know, another example is we just saw Amazon change county traffic lights so that union organizers didn't have as much time to talk to their workers. Uh, you know, I mean, these are kind of remarkable displays of political power that uh, ultimately either directly or indirectly are a cause of major resource extraction, not just in terms of money and people's take home pay, but in terms of their political power as that's manifested in, uh, you know, being able to squash a union union effort or being able to lobby for something that is favorable to your interests, but not favorable to others with whom you have financial or economic relationships. So I hope that kind of answered the questions. That's, that's how we tend to think about it. Thank you. One very last question and we're really running out of time. So Jim, we want a, a short answer from you, but this is really in your alley from Muftikan Atalay and say, if politics creates an environment for high market power, is it possible for high market power sectors to exist with inclusive institutions, in particular in countries like Peru and Ethiopia, where there is movement toward inclusive institutions, 
must markets inherently be competitive or can it be market power and inclusive institution at the same time? Yeah, I think you can. I think you can have market power. You know, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's network externalities, there's, you know, there's, there's scale economies, there's, you know, I think one of the reasons Amazon is exerting market power is, you know, is because of scale economy. So I think there's sort of natural monopolies. And, you know, I think, I think that's, yeah, I think that that happens, you know, to innovation. And so, yes, it, it can happen. Yeah. Okay, I will have a lot of other questions to ask you, but we're running out of time. I thank you very, very much for your insights uh, that are really fantastic. And I thank all the participants who have been so loyal and come to all this uh, very spread out conference over time. And you can find all the uh, panels uh, on the YouTube channel of Stiegler. So if you have missed one, please go back and look for them. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.